Hello, friends. Welcome to Chickenlandia and welcome to Bok Talk, your 100% friendly backyard chickens show. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me today. If you are here live on YouTube or if you are listening to me on the podcast, I am so glad to have you here in Chickenlandia. Now, I'm using a new program today, so I'm just going to turn it off right now because it's like really distracting me <laughs> before I get totally into this. Okay, um, today we're going to talk about something like, I have so been putting this off talking about this. I'm talking about two really important things this week. Today, we're talking about Merrick's disease, which many people have asked me to talk about before. And, you know, I've always just kind of put it off because it's like, you know, it's like serious. And <laughs> I try not to get too serious. But these are these are the things that we need to know about. You know, knowledge is power. We need to know about these things in Chickenlandia. Um, and then on Wednesday, and if you're listening to the podcast right now, it's already live. But if you are joining me live today, then it's not up yet. But I am uh, putting out a video about bird flu because it's time. We got to talk about it. It's in the U.S., so we got to talk about it. But today we're going to talk about the dreaded Merrick's disease. And I do have a question today, that a listener question that I will be answering and if you have a question that you would like to be considered for Bok Talk, you can send in that question by going to my website, welcometochickenlandia.com. Go to the contact section and then you'll see ask a chicken question. So you can go in there and put in your question. Um, I will say I'm not able to answer all the questions. I get, I get several questions a day and I just can't answer all the questions, but I do read them all. And... I do consider them all to answer on Bok Talk. So I, I love to hear from you guys. And you can also like, you can submit a little chicken story. If you have a little chicken story, you want to tell me. <laughs> all right. Um, before we get into it, there is one thing that I just want to remind you guys of because what we're talking about today, we're talking about disease. We're going to talk about vaccination. Um, I just want to remind you that I am not a veterinarian. I'm not a scientist. I am an educator. And as an educator, I want, I want to give you information so that you can make an informed choice. And that's why I'm here, so that you can feel more empowered about the choices that you make for your flock, okay? And I do want to say hello to people here. I, got, I have this new program today, and it's, it's kind of fun, and I kind of want to like play with it a little bit but <laughs> like I can pull let's see oh there I pulled a, <laughs> I pulled a uh a comment over Celia Perry hello it is okay that you're late thank you for being here Sunny's place is here Chickenlandia the Chickenlandia presidential advisor is here thank you so much for being here Tina Mel uh Michelle R Karen, Susie Floozy, so good to see you. John is here. That's actually my husband. It was a test comment. <laughs> All right. So I have two announcements today. And you know I have to make these announcements because I got to pay those chicken bills, people. <laughs> so as always, I want to let you guys know that this podcast was brought to you by the folks at My Favorite Chicken. My Favorite Chicken is my favorite online shop to get my feed, including scratch and peck feed, which is my favorite feed. Um, they are non-GMO, organic, socially, socially responsible, just a great company. Um, I get my chicken supplies from there. I get my fun chicken things, like my chicken purse is from there. <laughs> uh, it's called My Favorite Chicken. You can find them at myfavoritechicken.com, and I will put that link in the description. And this podcast was also brought to you by a company that I am super excited to be working with now. They are called Small Pet Select, and they have two products that I am currently using 
One is their organic pine shavings. And I, I showed those off at the la in the last video I did about the deep litter method. I showed off my organic pine shavings because I'm super proud of them. And they're great for deep litter, the deep litter method. And if you don't know what that is, watch my video from last week. Um, and the other one is a product called Pet Greens. And this is like a little pouch that they sell and you can grow sprouts right in the pouch. Like you put water in it and the sprouts grow out, grow out of it and then you can take it out to your chickens. There's a cat on the bag, but you can give it to chickens <laughs> or, or you can give it to your cat you know, if you want to. Or, you know, it says on there what, who, all the animals that you can give it to. Um, so you can check them out by clicking the link. I'm going to leave the, a link in the description and in the show notes for you. So definitely check them out. Okay. Drink. All right. Let's talk about Merrick's disease. Um, some of you probably already know this, but, uh, Chickenlandia is basically the island of misfit chickens. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that most of my chickens are rescues. Um, and this doesn't mean that they're like from bad homes. Like, I mean, I do have a few that they've had a rough start, but it just, it generally means that they came here from many different places and they came here likely because they didn't have anywhere else to go. So that's what I do. I love to do that. But um, the result of it is that I don't know what their history is. So I don't really know like what illnesses they've been exposed to, possibly, what illnesses they may have been have had and been treated for. I don't know what medicines that they've been on, usually. And I usually don't know uh, if they've been vaccinated for certain diseases or not. Um so there's a lot of unknowns. Hold on. Long, long notes today. <laughs> there's a lot of unknowns, but I don't let that stop me from doing what I love because I just, I really like to rescue chickens. So I understand what the risks are and I'm willing, I, I've like, you know, I've decided that I'm willing to take those risks in order to have a flock of with many rescued chickens in it and so i you know if i have room i i take in rescued chickens so um what i will say that is unless it is a very you know like some kind of really special circumstance the chickens that come to live with me they come to chickenlandia for life in other words i don't i don't rehome chickens that's just not what I usually do, um, there's been a, you know, a couple of super rare occasions where I have rehomed a chicken. And in those cases, I'm really upfront with what I know about their medical history and the kind of flock that I have. Uh, because I really believe that it's important to do that. You know, you should disclose the the possible risks of adopting adopting a chicken from your flock if you're going to be rehoming chickens, um, and it's just it's very important to me, um, and obviously because of the nature of my flock, I have dealt with chicken illnesses, and in fact, I'm dealing with a chicken that is not feeling all that great right now. Her name is Jaja. I was talking to her uh, talking about her on social media. Um, but she's getting better. She's on medication and she's getting better. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've dealt, I've dealt with a lot of illness and honestly, I feel like most flocks, even if you're like really careful, um, at some point they will be exposed to something and you will very likely deal with some kind of illness. Um, and that doesn't mean that's like, that doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you could have prevented it. It just happens. And I, I get, I do get a little bit frustrated because there are some chicken educators that are like, you know, if you do everything I say, your chickens are never going to get sick. And it's like, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. And, and then there's also some chicken educators that are like, I've never had a sick chicken. 
And, you know, if, you, if you're listening to the podcast and you can see my face right now, you could tell that I think that that is highly suspect. Like it, it, it could be possible. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's possible. Okay. I, I think it's unfair to put that expectation out there because then that makes people feel guilty if they end up with a sick chicken. And it's just so common. Like it, it happens. There's, there's pathology everywhere. You know, there's bacteria, viruses, you know, we, we need all that stuff. And, and sometimes those stuff get, that stuff gets out of balance. And so, um, Anyway, what I'm really trying to say is that um, if your chickens get sick, it is not your fault. And that includes if you end up with a Merix positive flock. So what is Merix disease? It is a herpes virus that has, has different strains. Um, chickens can carry it their whole life and never show any symptoms. They can be completely asymptomatic their whole life. Um, but uh, if they if they do get sick with it, then they can have, you know, it can take it can take different shapes. They can have like tumors really bad or they could have they could be become paralyzed. Um, they can go blind and it's I've seen a chicken that had I, I think it's called like ocular marics, but um and it looks really weird. Like one eye has like a tiny pupil and the other eye looks normal. And then eventually they die. Um, I mean, it may, maybe not, maybe they could survive with it. But I think in most cases that at that point that you will probably lose that chicken. Um, but it doesn't, you know, Merrick's doesn't transfer to humans. We wouldn't, we won't get Merrick's disease if we eat eggs from an infected chicken. Um, I wouldn't eat, you know, I just gen generally, if a chicken is, is actually actively sick with Marix, they're not going to be laying. Um, but if the chicken is just carrying the virus, then it's okay to eat the eggs. So as far as I know, I have not had personal experience with Marix. But uh, over the years, I've received many, many panicked messages from people who were just absolutely devastated because they learned that their flock had Merrick's, that they had a Merrick's positive flock. And, you know, probably in their grief and confusion and wanting to get information, they went onto social media and they said, oh my gosh, this has happened. What do I do? What does this mean? And many times they will get some really disheartening information back. And that will sometimes include like, you need to call your entire flock and you need to burn down your coop and you, you know, you shouldn't have chickens for two years or maybe you shouldn't have had chickens at all if you can't take care of them or just, you know, just some really uh, drastic measures. Now, I will say that if you're a breeder or if you have some other kind of chicken business, or if you have, you know, if you're selling eggs or whatever, this is not good news. This would not be good news for you. And you will have to make some, some difficult decisions. But for most of the people that are watching this channel um, or listening to this podcast, it's people that have, you know, their own flocks for their families. You know, maybe they're giving eggs to their neighbors. Maybe they're selling a few eggs, but it's not like, they have this like poultry business. Okay, so in that case, I don't necessarily agree with this idea that you're just doomed. Okay, um, and I'm going to break it down right now why I feel this way. And I, <laughs> I, am, I will probably be thoroughly attacked for this. Like it'll be like I'm a, a tiny lizard in a chicken coop, you know, <laughs> they're going to come after me. <laughs> um, but I'm, I believe I'm speaking the truth here and at least I'm speaking my truth and I believe in getting this information out there. But, um, in the United States, Merrix is everywhere. It is extremely common. And in fact, oh my goodness, I did not bring, I did not bring my book. I was going to bring a book it is Gail Damero's book. Um, it is by Story Publishing. It, it's uh, through Story Publishing, and it's called The Chicken Health Handbook. 
And you know what? I'm going to go grab that book right now because I want to read you guys. I really want to read you guys an, uh, a piece of it that I thought when I read it, it just absolutely blow, blew my mind. And I'm going to read it to you, but I want you to know I'm not saying that this is not a serious disease. I'm not saying that it's not something that you should be concerned about. But I feel like um, there's a lot of alarmist information out there. And I think if you have all the information, you can make really informed and choice choices about it. So I'm going to go grab that book really quick. Talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to get a drink. Look at that U-Haul box. I still have U-Haul boxes. Okay, I'll be right back. Yes, I'm wearing sweatpants. <laughs> I have a cute, super cute shirt up here and some raggedy old sweatpants underneath. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read you guys a little bit out of this book where uh, Gail Damero, who I, who I believe, and I hope I'm pronouncing her last name right, but I believe like she is like, I don't know, um... I think she's the, she's definitely the educator that I most admire. Um, she is just really, really knowledgeable. And, you know, her chicken books were the first books that I picked up when I was just getting started with chicken. So this is out of the Chicken Health Handbook. And I'm going to put a link. I'm not sponsored, but I will put a link to this book in the description and, the sh and in the show notes. And it's from Story Publishing, which is a great company. Okay, the Marix virus. Marix is one of the most widely studied chicken diseases. Entire books have been written about this one condition alone. It is so common. Are you ready to hear this? <laughs> it is so common that you can safely assume your chickens have the virus, even if they don't show any signs of infection. So, Obviously, having seen what I've seen in like chicken groups and having read many, lots of information about Marix, that statement really surprised me. But before I read that, I already had an inkling that it was more common than we really thought it was. And that this whole idea about it being basically like, like the boogeyman um, was possibly you know, kind of wrong, wrong headed. Um, but it is, you know, and then, like I said, I'm not saying that it's not a terrible disease. It can be, but I think it's important for us to know the truth about it. Okay. Um, and, and the other thing is that I feel like a lot of people that have Merrick's positive flocks, <laughs> they end up feeling ashamed or that like they somehow failed and or that they have like this really horrible luck and they don't realize how common it is. So, um, but the thing about Merrick's is that, like I said, it can be dormant for possibly the whole life of a chicken. Um, and if they are living in a stress-free environment, if they're getting the right nutrition, if they're not being overcrowded and they're enjoying good health, then they're they're likely not to come down with it and have these these ter you know these terrible outcomes. So let me just read you. I'm going to read you just a, a few more sentences out of this book. Uh, the virus can remain dormant in a chicken's body, becoming active as a result of stress caused by overcrowding, being moved, poor ventilation an overload of worms, or even the natural process of maturing and beginning to lay. It can also s cause slow-growing tumors that produce no other signs until they become so massive in an aging bird that the chicken cannot survive. So 
I just, you know, I, I just felt like it's really important for you guys to know that. And it will, you know, what I think is interesting is that she mentions overcrowding. She mentions poor ventilation. And these are conditions that exist in factory farms. So that's why I think that Merrick's gets so much alarmist attention is because a lot of the science that we receive as backyard chicken keepers about it is through that factory farm lens. Um, and, you know, in fact, the vaccine was created not because Merrick's was killing backyard chickens, but because it was affecting the bottom line of the factory farms. And I'm, that's not a commentary on whether or not you should vaccinate, but I'm telling you why it was created. Because at the time, it wasn't killing off a lot of chickens, but it was it was making them lay less, like it was affecting their production. And so, and also, you know, with meat birds, it could, it could affect that too. So, so that's really why it's, it's a reportable disease because that, you know, they need to keep track of it because it affects the poultry industry so much. Okay. So with all of this in mind, <laughs> woo, we're getting deep today. I'm like, I'm like nervous right now. <laughs> Factory farms are going to come after me. Seriously nervous. But you know what? It's the truth. Okay, so um, with all this in mind, let's get to the question that was asked by one of our listeners. Um, and again, if you want to submit a question to be answered on Bok Talk, you can go to my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com. Go to the contact section and submit your question. I'd love to hear from you. So this question is from a listener that put their name down as chicken lover. <laughs> First name chicken, last name lover. Okay, what are your thoughts about the Merrick's vaccine? Is it a better idea to get my chicks that I am hatching myself vaccinated for the Merrick's disease? Okay, thank you for that question, chicken lover. So, okay, so older chickens can, they can be vaccinated for Marix, but considering that they need to be, they need to be vaccinated before they are exposed to Marix and considering that Marix is like literally everywhere, we were just talking about that, it's all over the place. I think if you do decide to vaccinate your chickens for Marix, then or against Marix, then it really needs to happen at hatch or by the hatchery if you decide to get them from the hatchery. Um, and you can purchase, you know, you probably, I actually, I'll put a link to some information about where you can purchase the vaccines in the description and in the show notes. Um, but here's some important things that I think you need to know about the Marix vaccine. And the, the first thing is, is that it does not prevent chickens from getting the disease. Um, and in fact, they can still have symptoms, although the symptoms will likely be very mild. Um, and even rarely, they can still die from it. There's like a certain percentage of chickens that will still get it and still die from it. They, they are less likely to spread it, but they can still spread it, okay? So I think when you are deciding whether or not to do it, um, basically you just need to understand that you're making a decision for your flock, but that it's, it's not necessarily going to make other people's flocks safer if your flock is mingling or if you you know if you're rehoming or if you're going to shows or anything like that, okay, it, it could make them a little bit safer, but it's not foolproof, okay. Um, so I think you know how I would make this decision is I would decide, okay, what am I able to handle? Like what level of risk I'm able to am I able to handle? With my flock, I I take on a ton of risk, but it's worth it to me. You know, it's worth it to me to take on that risk. But I know that I could have, you know, if I, if I got them tested, I could end up with a Marix positive flock. I could, you know, discover that. I could have birds die. I mean, that is reality of what I'm doing. But I'm, I'm very responsible about it. Um, 
If you can't handle the idea of losing a chicken and you just really want to do everything to prevent them coming down with something, then I think, um, you know, first, first, first and foremost, take really good care of your flock, which we do, you know, if you're watching this channel, you probably already do. And then, you know, vaccination might be something for you to seriously consider if you, if you really feel like, you know, this is not something that I want to deal with, then you might consider that. Page turning break. <laughs> is that it? Okay. But, you know, the, I, I just the one issue that I have with the vaccine is that I feel like it kind of gives people a false sense that they are not spreading it when in reality they could still be spreading it and they still need to take precautions and they still need to be responsible and they still need to disclose, you know, whatever medical information that they can about their flock to people when they're rehoming their chickens or if they're selling chickens or, you know, if they're going to chicken shows and stuff like that, they just need to be really aware of those risks um, you know, should Merrick's disease stop you from doing any of those things? I think that's something that you have to decide, but, you know, considering it is everywhere and this is what people do, it's part of like the chicken keeping community. We, we show our chickens, we rehome chickens, we, you know, we adopt chickens and all that kind of stuff. Y you know, it's just like, you just have to weigh like what, what is most important to me? And I think whatever decision you make, I think it's okay. And I think, you know, definitely what I would say is if you end up with Merrick's in your flock, I just want you to know it's not the end of the world and it's not your fault. And I want you to know, I want you to know the truth. So I, and I definitely, I wish I could tell you what to do. I wish I could just make that decision for you, but all I can do is just make sure that the decision that you make is from an informed place. And um, above all, above all, no matter what, I think the, the mo really the best thing for you to do for your flock is to take really good care of them. You know, make sure that they have good nutrition. Make sure that they have enough space. Make sure that they have a stress-free life. And... If you want to learn more about how to do all those things, the chicken landy way, like the way <laughs> the way that I do it, uh, and the way that a lot of people in Chickenlandia Nation do it, um, then please please check out my online course. It's called um, Backyard Chickens 101: A Chicken Course for Everyone, and I talk in that course about a lot of things that you can do. First of all, just like basic chicken care because it's like for, it's for beginners and it's for intermediate people. But I do talk about like immune boosting things that you can do and just things that will help you feel like you have a little bit, you know, like you have, you've, you're just a little bit more empowered over the health of your flock and just keeping them healthy, caring for them naturally and that is really going to be your first line of defense against anything, really against anything. Okay, so if you want to check that out, you can go to my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com. And I do have a section where I talk about the course and you can sign up for it. We would love to see you there. It's interactive and it's fun. And uh, if you have questions, you can ask them in the course and Kelsey, who is another instructor in the course, she's a Chickenlandia presidential advisor. She and I answer those questions very quickly. Okay. So anyway, I want to let you know about that and all this other stuff. You can take it and go out there and be strong and make the right decision for your flock. <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness. All right, I am going to open up the chat for questions. So if you have a question, please type it in all caps so that I can see it. Because, you know, these glasses can only do so much. These eyes keep getting older. 
<laughs> if you have a question, ask it in all caps so I can see it. Oh gosh, there's so many. Judy Zims, just a mere farmsteader, says, that's my first line of defense. Build up natural immunity and health. Ain't that the truth? Okay. So Nona Grace, hi Nona Grace, is asking, what are the signed signs and symptoms to look for? Well, you know, um, obviously, like if it's, you can look, if there's any kind of, um, something doesn't look right in the eyes, that would be an indication where you might be concerned about it. If they suddenly can't walk, and definitely if they have like, one leg in front and then like one leg in back. And it just seems like they can't kind of, they just can't get up and walk. Like all of a sudden they're wobbly. That's another thing um, that can be an indication. Um, obviously if they have visible tumors or if you take them to the vet and you realize they have tumors, um, that would be another indication. And then just like general, generally if they're like listless, uh, they're lethargic. Um, there's many other symptoms and I can't think of all of them right now. Um, but I would, you know, sometimes they can just die all of a sudden and you don't even really know what it was. But certainly if I was having more than one chicken come down with an illness, uh, I would probably think, hmm, I wonder what's going on. And definitely if you're, if you're seeing some of this, like, uh, you know, they can't walk or they're becoming paralyzed, anything like that. Good question. Thank you. Uh, Homestead Jen asks, uh, can you discuss coccidiosis? I actually just put a video out about coccidiosis in chickens, and you can find that on my YouTube channel. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a whole nother long discussion. <laughs> we could do a whole, a whole podcast about it. In fact, I think I have done a whole podcast about it. Um, but that, you know, that's another one where there's different strains. Chickens can build immunity. Uh, and there are medications about, you know, medications for it, but definitely I think you should check out, um, the video that I just posted about it. And you can find that by going to my YouTube channel. It's called Welcome to Chickenlandia and you're on it right now. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm dealing with a new, like this is a new um, program that I'm using. I assume it's like working well. Um, so it's all different. So I'm just getting used to it because, of course, I didn't even like practice. I just like did it. <laughs> okay, Celia Perry asks, any recommendations for integrating a new rooster into a flock? Oh, with another, or do you mean with another rooster? Um, okay, so that can get a little bit tricky uh, depending on the breed and the personality of the rooster that you have. They could definitely fight. And what I have found is that if you're going to be adding another rooster to a flock, um, you know, it helps to have a nice gentle rooster that's in the, already in your established flock. And it also helps to add them a little bit younger than you normally would. So I would start, I would, you know, try and get them outside and in kind of a separate but seeing situation where they're separate, the new rooster is separate from the flock, but the flock can still see them and the rooster will still see them, but they're pretty young. Like when, once they're fully feathered, just have them out there spending time with the flock. Um, and then, 
you know, I would say, you know, normally I would say wait until 12 weeks to try integrating them with a flock, but you might try a little bit sooner than that, like nine or 10 weeks, maybe 10 weeks, uh, depending on their size. And you also have to keep a really good eye on them. But it's generally best, like the younger you can integrate a new rooster into a flock, the better luck you will have. But there, you need to have a, you need to have a contingency plan because it could be a situation where you cannot integrate a new rooster into a flock if you're if your established rooster wants nothing to do with that <laughs> like they, they could fight and so and roosters depending on their personalities they can fight they can fight until one of them is dead so um that may not be the case and it really like i said it depends on the breed and it depends on uh the age and the personality of the rooster so uh you know the younger the younger the better but make sure that you keep a really good eye because you don't like if you try and integrate them and they're really young and itty bitty they could get attacked by the flock and you don't want that okay but good luck with that let me know how it goes Judy Zims, just a mere farmsteader, asks, uh, I really need to know one or two reliably good automatic doors. Um, so I have one that I really like. It's actually from my favorite chicken. I think it's called the Coop Defender. I think that's the name of it. Um, I don't use an automatic door because I have ducks and they don't go to bed on time. (laughs) Anybody that has ducks, no, they don't go. Yeah, you got to go out there and tell them to go to bed. Go to bed. Um, I will put a link to that in the description and in the show notes. I confess that I, you know, I don't have like a ton of knowledge on the, the, you know, what the best ones are. I haven't used a whole bunch of different uh, coop doors, but, um, uh, automatic doors. But this one I know is a good quality. And I know a lot of people that have had it that really like it. Sorry, guys. Sorry. It's taking a long time. I'm just trying to figure out these freaking comments. <laughs> Uh, anonymous ask an interest is asking an interesting question. Do you believe in natural remedies after symptoms begin being able to work? Okay. I think what you're saying is like, once they have symptoms, do you think natural remedies will work? Um, it depends obviously on the illness. It depends on the severity of the illness. I will tell you that I very rarely medicate my chickens. And like I said, I've dealt with a lot of illness. Specifically, I've dealt with a lot of respiratory illness in my flock. And many, many times I have used homeopathics. I have used um, essential oils. I do not put essential oils on my chickens. I do not put them in my chickens. But I have used them as you know to help to I, I I will take I'll just tell you what I do I take a paper towel I put some drops of essential oils in it that are clearing so and, and that, that are very gentle so I'll put um eucalyptus peppermint um sometimes I'll put tea tree uh, thyme um lavender just uh, these gentle essential oils that can help kind of clear congestion and clear the air and so I will hang that up in my coop Um, just to help with those symptoms. But I feel like a lot of times with supportive care, you can get chickens through an illness, but it really depends. Like right now I have a chicken that is taking antibiotics and I don't normally do that, but there are times when you need it. So, you know, I just posted on Instagram last night, like chicken land and chicken landia, we aren't about absolutes. So I would never say like, Never use antibiotics on your flock. Never give your flock medications. Um, only use natural remedies. Like there, there is a time and a place for synthetic medications. And 
what I will say is it's not the first thing I reach for unless it's the only option I have. So usually it's not the first thing I reach for. Um, and I'm lucky in that I have a lot, I have a lot of experience with homeopathics. Um, and I have, our family has a homeopath and she tr- will treat my chickens. <laughs> so, you know, I have a lot of options and I've been doing like the natural thing for a long time. Um, and I do have a blog post about homeopathics w- in chickens, about using homeopathics on chickens. And I can post that in the description and in the show notes for you. But I do, I do believe in natural remedies. I have seen them work many, many times. I've seen herbs. I've seen homeopathics. Um, I've seen essential oils really help. And then just supportive care, like vitamins and probiotics and stuff like that. Um, that's what I reach for first. Now, for something like Merrick's disease, I think it's possible that you could support them th- through it because there's not a cure for it. It's a, it's a, it's a virus. It's a herpes virus. So once they have it, like it's, they have it for life. So you can support them through the illness. Um, but it's likely that at some point that it's going to, it's going to take them out. Like if they're, if they're having symptoms, it will likely take them out at some point. So, I mean, I would say at that point, it would be a good idea to consult a licensed veterinarian. Um, and then I all I cannot, and I know I keep talking about this, but I cannot recommend this book enough, the, the Chicken Health Handbook. I think everybody really should have it on hand. Um, you know, I, I don't know, you guys probably know that I'm writing a book. It's not coming out until next year. Um, but it's like a beginner book and this, the, the chicken health handbook, it like, it just lists like all the things, all the diseases that you might deal with at one point and it gives you all the information. So I think it's definitely something that you would want to have in your, um, chicken arsenal, I guess, <laughs> if, that's the, if that's the right word, I am going to answer one more question. Okay, I'm going to answer two more questions. Um, Tina, I know because I saw that you had asked it before. What vaccinations do you use for hens over a year? Um, I don't, I, you know, I can't think, oh gosh. The vaccinations that I would think, you know, Merrick's is really the main vaccination that you would get uh, if you're getting chickens from, chicks from a hatchery. Um, I think foul pox you can give after their chicks, but I cannot remember, um, coccidiosis vaccine they need as babies. So I think, you know, within my situation, like for me to vaccinate chickens that are coming into my flock and they're over a year old, I I don't know their medical history, so I wouldn't want to be like repeating a vaccine that they'd already received. So I, that's just not something that I do within my flock. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't think, you know, um, um, the, uh, presidential chicken landia presidential advisor. If you have anything to add to that, you can add it in the comments for Tina, please. Okay. There was one more question I was going to answer. Uh, I wanna, I, I wanna, <laughs> and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name, Iwana, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. You asked, have you used colloidal silver for your chickens? Yes, I have. Um, colloidal silver is great. Like if they have, um, some eye irritation, I will use that. I will, I have a spray that I will use. If they have a respiratory illness, sometimes I will spray that just around their face just so they can, it's antibacterial um, and it just helps to, you know, kill off any germs and keep that, keep those germs at bay. Um, There are, there was one time when I had a chicken that had, had an internal infection and she had been on antibiotics twice already. She'd been on two courses of antibiotics. And at a certain point, it's just like, I'm not putting them on antibiotics again. Um, so I did it and I was like, you know, I'm just going to give her some 
colloidal silver. So what I did was is that I looked up the dosage for parrots mm-hmm. because there's more information on that online than there is for chickens. And I gave her a pretty hefty dose of colloidal silver morning and night. Um, I just mixed it with some egg yolk. And she actually recovered. Um, and she lived another, probably like another year. Um, and eventually she did die. It was just, you know, she never laid eggs again. So young chickens, they can't, you know, they can't live long if they're just never going to lay eggs again. Um, I mean, they could, I would certainly let them, but they, <laughs> they just can't like, you know, internal laying or, you know, it's just not good. It's not a good scenario if they're not laying. So, um, she did end up passing away, but she had a decent quality of life and it did really help and it helped to extend her life. So yes, I have used it. Um, if you're nervous about using it internally, I would just keep it on hand for, uh, you know, if your chickens get some kind of external injury, you can, you know, a, a, a not a very serious one, but, um, you know, a scrape or a cut or something like that. It's great to use to spray on, on some type of injury, mild injury like that. So I do keep it on hand. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. I feel like this was a really special episode. I feel like, you know, people just don't get a lot of information about Merrix. And so they're kind of left in this place where there's a lot of fear. And I'm somebody that just really wants to Make sure that people have all the information that they have so that they don't have to be afraid. Um, I want to thank the moderators. We've got three moons over mayhem was here today. 13 moons. I'm sorry. I wrote down three moons. So that's why I keep saying that. 13 moons over mayhem. Thank you for being our moderator today. And also my co-producer was moderating Kelsey Paulus, also known as the Chickenlandia Presidential Advisor. Thank you to Talking Crows for editing this episode and to Double M Ranch for their wonderful podcast art. Folks, if you enjoyed this podcast, please remember to give it a like. Or if you're listening to it, you can rate and review it, especially if you're on Apple Podcasts. That really helps to get, you know, my podcast out there to get more ears and eyes on it. Okay, so definitely take a moment to do that if you can. And there's something else I want you to take a moment to do. And that is, I want you to always remember that you are always welcome in Chickenlandia. (laughs) Bye, guys. Thank you so much.